Okay, so yesterday we went to this little program here and today we will talk about functional genomics and then transcription elongation and its regulation. And hopefully you will also see why functional genomics is needed in addition to biochemistry and structural biology to bring everything together and to really understand the mechanism of transcription. So here we are, let's get started. So one thing you have to realize is that uh, when you do biochemistry, uh, it's a bottom-up approach, right? So you prepare proteins, you purify proteins, uh, you have nucleic acids, and you uh, reconstitute transcription in the test tube, right? You prepare certain complexes in the test tube, and then you look at their structure. You can also look at their function using various biochemical methods. But this is a bottom-up approach. It's very valuable because you know exactly what you're doing, right? You know exactly what you put into your test tube. But then you also want to know eventually, of course, how transcription works in living cells, right? That is, must be our aim. And so how do you do that? Because in cells, things are extremely complicated. This is why we do biochemistry and structural biology. But on the other hand, we want to investigate transcription in cells. And this is done by functional genomics, right? So this is now the top-down approach, right? You have bottom-up with biochemistry, structural biology, and top-down uh, using functional genomics. Why is it top-down? Because you, you start with cell culture. You have living cells in your test tubes, right? And then you open the cells and you take out, for example, the RNA products and you analyze the RNA products. And that gives you some insights into cellular activity. But when you think about it carefully, uh, you will realize that these methods have to be really sophisticated, right? Because now you're looking at all genes in parallel. It's a systemic approach. Instead of looking at one piece of DNA or one gene, you now look at all genes uh, at the same time. And you have to have very good methods in terms of sensitivity, temporal resolution, but also the bioinformatics. Uh, we actually call it computational biology because it's about asking a biological question and addressing it with computational methods. So the computational biology is actually the glue between those two fields. So what you have to realize in this research approach is the following. You can conduct experiments using biochemistry, structural biology, and then you can generate a hypothesis, right? For example, you can say, oh, this residue is important for the function, right? You have a hypothesis. But then you need to test that hypothesis. You have to make a mutation and introduce that to cells and see you know, what's happening in cells. So then you can basically use that hypothesis, ask a question. And you can go the other way around, right? You can collect data from living cells, for example, using transcriptomics or other methods. And then you can do a correlation analysis of those data. And you can also generate a hypothesis. But again, right, it's just a correlation. It's an hypothesis based on a correlation. But then you can ask, you know, in the in vitro system, is there, you know, any support for my hypothesis, right? So if I have a correlation, I have a hypothesis, and I can then conduct an experiment, design an experiment to address the hypothesis. So basically, when you close that circle, then um, you get very close at a real understanding of transcription as a system. Because basically you can ask any question you want, you can generate hypotheses in, in various ways. And this you have to keep in mind, also in other fields it's similar. Then you know maybe people will not use functional genomics, they may use light microscopy or other approaches. But the in vitro and in vivo approach, when you bring them together, you can basically test your hypotheses. Right? And you can get closer to an understanding of a biological phenomenon. That's very important to remember. Now, when you actually look at the situation in cells, it's far more complex than you would have imagined. You know, when we entered the field, then you could see in the literature, people would say, oh, now we can sequence. So we sequence all the RNAs, and then we know about transcription activity of the cell. And this is, of course, not true. Why is it not true? 
when you just measure the abundance of RNA, you, it's not just transcription activity that you look at, it's also the activity of RNA degradation, right? And so um, the way to address that is to use a concept called mRNA metabolism. So mRNA should be regarded as a molecule that is turned over, right? It's synthesized, but it's also degraded. It's also transported to various places in the cell. So we talked about the divergent antisense transcription yesterday, right? These are very short-lived products uh, that you can observe. But then in the sense direction, you generate pre-messenger RNAs, but they will be processed very rapidly. So very often you will not see the introns because they are spliced out and rapidly degraded. So you will often then only detect the mature messenger RNAs. Uh, but also, you know, under some circumstances, you can even see some of the degradation intermediates. And such degradation happens mainly in the cytosol after mRNAs have been uh, exported. Now, what are the technologies? You all know the first generation uh, sequencing, of course, um, but then the second generation came and basically what methods like Illumina are doing is to parallelize the first generation sequencing. So now you have, you know, a little uh, flow cell. It's about, you know, maybe that size, about that size of, of my uh, laser pointer here, uh, just very, very thin. And that flow cell now, um, uh, you can basically s s sequence DNA uh, in parallel on many different of these little spots that you have on flow cells. So the reaction is carried out locally and you have these chain terminating uh, fluorescent nucleotides and you can read out then the sequencing reaction, uh, the many, many sequencing reactions in parallel, right? And that has led to this explosion in uh, sequence data because now we can basically within hours sequence a human genome. You can get millions of so-called reads overnight with these machines. So you can produce a lot of data this way. Then what could be done of course is not just to sequence the DNA but also to sequence the RNA because you can convert RNA uh, into DNA uh, producing cDNA, and then you can actually uh, sequence those DNAs with Illumina and you get insights into the RNAs you have in your cells, right? And then what you can do is, if you have a reference genome, you can align those RNA reads to the genome and then you actually know which regions of the genome have produced RNAs. In this case, stable RNAs because you isolate the RNA and you sequence everything, right? And that is actually a method that nowadays is totally routine, but it's not that old, you know. It's uh, maybe, you know, 2005, 2007, and people started to do that. And initially, we also, you know, started to do that using Affymetrix arrays, um, if you still remember those. Uh, but that was very rapidly then uh, uh, replaced by sequencing. And the reason is sequencing is unbiased. You just sequence everything you have in your sample and if you have enough in your sample, you will get some sequence. Now, when you have a microarray, you put probes on your array. So basically you put in prior knowledge and that gives you a bias, right? You will only detect what you look for. Whereas with sequencing, you detect everything. And this is actually how these divergent transcripts were found. They were not found using Affymetrix uh, arrays because we didn't know that there's RNA produced from these antisense regions. But then when people did sequencing, they suddenly found those RNAs. So that's why it's important to have an unbiased approach. Now you may say that's fine, but actually I don't learn about transcription and RNA degradation, right? I only get an inventory of the cell. What kind of RNA do I find? So if you want to learn about transcription, you have to have a method that detects newly synthesized RNA, right? So then you can uncouple the presence of an RNA from its degradation. You only look at new synthesis of RNA. And um, 
This is a method that uh, we have also contributed to developing, and that is uh, using metabolic RNA labeling. So what is the idea here? The idea is the following. What if we can label RNA during transcription, during the synthesis, and then purify only the newly synthesized RNA? Then we can throw away all the pre-existing old RNA, and when we then sequence, we only get the RNAs that have been produced over the last few minutes by the cell. So then we can safely say, oh, the amount of RNA I get now reflects real transcription activity. Right? And when you know this and you also know the total RNA, then from the ratio, you can also estimate RNA degradation. Right? Because now you have an estimate of how much RNA you have in total, and you have an estimate of how much of this RNA is newly synthesized. So then, by the ratio, you get an idea of uh, the degradation uh, of these RNAs, how quickly they are degraded, or in other words, you get a measure of the half-life of those RNAs. So how does it work? Well, you take these uh, special uh, nucleosides, for example, for thiouridine, has a thiol group here, this double bond actually can be changed. You know, you can write down a formula, then you have SH here. So um, when you use such nucleosides, they can enter cells which carry a transporter on uh, the surface. And then those nucleosides will be converted in cells into triphosphate moieties, so nucleoside triphosphates. And they can be used as substrates by the RNA polymerases, and they will then be incorporated instead of the natural nucleotide into the newly synthesized RNA. So now what happens, you have some pre-existing RNA in the cell, but now you also, after a few minutes or so, have newly synthesized RNA, and the newly synthesized RNA is now labeled. And since you have a thiol group, you can use biochemistry to purify the newly synthesized RNA. So you can sequence the total RNA and then the fraction of newly synthesized, and from that you get insights into transcription activity, RNA synthesis activity, and RNA degradation activity, or in other words, the half-life of the RNAs. So we call that 4TU-seq or 4SU-seq, uh, because you can do it with uracil or uridine. And then you uh, can, that's just an example, you know, looking at one single gene in the fission yeast POMBI, uh, you can, for example, label for two minutes, four, six, eight, ten minutes, and so forth. And what you see here is something very interesting. When you label for a short time, you know, the newly synthesized RNA over this gene here, which is um, spliced, right, it contains four intronic sequences, the newly synthesized RNA is distributed rather evenly. But then when you look after, you know, 10 minutes of labeling or in the steady state, you see these gaps here. You see these gaps where you have less newly synthesized RNA. And these are the intronic sequences that are spliced out and then degraded, right? So you see that, you know, there's RNA metabolism going on in cells. And, you know, with the labeling, you can actually capture reads of intronic sequences that you will not capture in steady state because these sequences are very short-lived. So the likelihood to capture them is, is lower. Right? And basically, with these technologies, when you couple them to mathematical modeling, uh, kinetic modeling, you can actually extract rates for the RNA metabolism. So this was very pleasing because now, you know, we can look at the synthesis of RNAs. This is basically the distribution of um, RNA synthesis rates per minute um, in uh, POMBI cells, so fission yeast cells, where we also developed this protocol. And so you get a distribution, you know, some genes, of course, have low synthesis rates, some have high synthesis rates. So you directly see uh, the transcription activity. And then the degradation you can estimate, as we discussed, you also see a distribution here. And you can even estimate splicing rates from the disappearance of those 
intronic reads. You've probably seen here, you know, some disappear quickly and others like this one here more slowly. So the splicing is different for different introns and you can also then, you know, estimate splicing uh, rates so you can really get an overview of, of RNA metabolism, synthesis, degradation, processing. Now, the reason why we develop these methods in yeast is quite simple because you have far less genes, about you know, 6,200, 6,300 genes in, in, um, in the budding yeast, uh, Cerevisiae, and in human you have 22,000 or something genes, right? But that's not all, it's also the length of the transcripts. So here in this little plot you actually have the length distribution of the yeast transcripts. So up here are the shortest transcripts, you know, just maybe a few hundred or so nucleotides. And down here, the longest, up to two, three thousand, maybe four thousand, that's it. When you now compare that to human transcript length, you get a plot like this. So this is to scale, you know. So it goes on 20 times, basically, outside of the room. Uh, the short transcripts are a few thousand or so, but then you can have transcripts that are extremely long. Uh, tens of thousands of nucleotides, hundreds of thousands of nucleotides. And the reason is the long introns, right? The actual coding sequence is not that much longer than in yeast, but the transcript, the initial transcript is huge because introns are very, very long. And basically the structure of, of human genes is like you have these short exonic sequences and the intervening introns are huge. So Basically, a transcript is like, or this transcriptome of humans is an ocean of non-coding RNA with tiny little islands of coding RNA. You always have to keep that in mind, right? So what do you do then when you want to apply such methods uh, to the human system? You run in trouble, right? Because now you, you have also um, far less reads because the transcriptome is so huge that you know your sensitivity of your experiment goes down. You only capture some RNAs a few times and not hundreds or thousands of times, right? So how do you do it? Um, the way we did it is we developed a protocol called transient transcriptome sequencing. And you know now it feels for us like everybody's doing this and it's an old method, but it, it's not so long ago <laughs> that this was developed. But now it's, it's a routine method that we just use to phenotype any human cells, you know, after we have mutated or when we change condition. Uh, it also works in mouse cells, other mammalian cells. So the trick here is the following. You do exactly what you do in yeast, but you have to invent one single trick, and that is this fragmentation step. So why is that important? You have to imagine the following. In yeast, you know, a gene takes only half a minute or so to transcribe, maybe one minute. So if you have a five minute labeling pulse, your genes have been transcribed, right? And you get an RNA that is labeled. Now imagine a human gene. I think I told you yesterday, the average length human gene takes 40 minutes to be transcribed. So now if you do a five minute labeling pulse, only part of your gene is transcribed. So only a small part is actually labeled, right? So how do you overcome this problem? If you would not do anything, right? You get something like that. You get all these partial transcripts, and then they are only labeled at the end, right? For basically the last five minutes, it gives you the label, and that is or the labeled fraction of the RNA, and that is uh, here this blue end. So you can do that. You can sequence. It, it's a little bit better than normal RNA seq, but it doesn't help you much. Uh, but if you do a fragmentation step, you have all these little fragments of, let's say, 1,000 or so nucleotides, and then you purify only the labeled fragments, and you throw away all the pre-existing fragments. Then you get a much higher uh, sensitivity, and you only label RNA fragments of this human cell that have been synthesized over the last five minutes, nothing else. And you don't get this bias here by pre-existing RNA because you throw away all the pre-existing RNA. And then you get, you know, really beautiful data. I just show you for one single gene, I, I show you data. Now what you can do is the following. You take a human cell culture and, um, you know, you change the conditions. 
For example, you can add a chemical so that the cells, uh, that an immune response is uh, triggered, right? Something like that. Or you can change the buffer conditions, or you can heat shock the cells, right? Increase the temperature and see what kind of stress genes are now switched on. Or you can do a differentiation, like you can start with one cell type and convert it into another cell type. And then you can see how which genes are down-regulated, which are up-regulated. And so you can do all these beautiful experiments and directly monitor the landscape, the transcription landscape in human cells and how it's dynamically changing when you change the conditions. Right? And what we did here is that we monitored the transcription response uh, after stimulation of T cells with ionomycin. So basically an immune response is simulated, if you wish. So the genes that are important for the immune response are switched on. And this is one important gene, the FOS gene, actually encoding a transcription factor that will switch immune genes on. And you know, this is happening extremely quickly. You can imagine when you want to switch on a T cell, uh, to trigger an immune response has to be quick. And you can monitor that with TTSeq because not only is it very sensitive to pick up the newly synthesized RNA, it's also, it also has a very good temporal resolution. So with standard methods, when you do this experiment, you have to wait one or two hours to see uh, that you know, RNA signals are changing slightly when you look at total RNA. But when you look at the newly synthesized RNA fragments that you capture by labeling, you can see within minutes that the genes are switched on. So it's very sensitive. And you see that here, you know, zero, then five minutes, 10, 15. So after five minutes, you already get this massive signal and then it goes up more after 10 and 15 minutes. And what is really exciting is that not only do you see, uh, you know, mRNA uh, signals coming up uh, for newly synthesized mRNA, you also see non-coding RNAs that are very short-lived, like the enhancer RNAs. So remember yesterday I explained to you the enhancer is an element, or these are elements that can be far away, but they can activate transcription, right? And so what has been found also as the methods got more sensitive, that enhancers also produce RNA it's very short-lived non-coding RNA and also very short RNA fragments, but um, these enhancer RNAs are indicative of an enhancer uh, doing its job, of an enhancer becoming active, right? And so you can use that as a proxy for enhancer activity. When an enhancer produces enhancer RNA, that's a sign that this DNA region is open, polymerases can access it, and they produce these enhancer RNAs. And so, this is a known enhancer of the FOS gene. You see it's 20,000 base pairs away, far away from the uh, promoter. But then when you look here, after five minutes, there's hardly any signal. After 10 minutes, you get this massive peak, 15 minutes. And you also get a peak in the anti-sense direction. So basically what happens is the enhancer is not producing any RNA. And then, you know, when you switch on, uh, or you trigger this immune response, suddenly you get strong signals in sense and anti-sense direction, indicative of the enhancer now activating the FOS gene. So these are the kind of things you can see, and now you have to realize that this method is genome-wide. So you can look at hundreds and hundreds of genes, and it's equally sensitive for down-regulation. Now, if you do a standard RNA-seq, you cannot see the down-regulation well because RNAs live for a long time. So when you switch off the gene, the RNA will still live on for hours and hours until it's finally degraded, right? Unless there's some active degradation mechanism. But with this method, when you switch the gene off, you, boof, immediately lose the signal, right? This is because there's no new synthesis, so there's no signal anymore. Now, it becomes even better <laughs> because the third generation sequencing methods are there. In particular, the Oxford nanopore method, but there's also other methods. And so why is that third generation? What is different? What is different is that you can really now sequence individual DNA and RNA molecules directly. So it's really on the level of 
single molecules. And the way it works is you have a membrane protein and uh, through a gradient, through actually um, uh, a charge on one side, you can suck the DNA or RNA single strand through that pore. And as it is uh, traveling through the pore, the conductivity of that channel is changing slightly depending on the, you know, the, the bases that are passing through the pore. And you can learn the pattern, uh, how this changes with certain sequences, and then you can uh, read the sequence. Now, there's a huge error rate. I don't know what it currently is. It used to be, you know, one in 10 or one in 20 bases are wrong. But for transcriptomics, that doesn't matter, right? Because if you have a long piece of RNA with few errors in it, you can still align it to your reference genome, and you will still know, oh, this RNA comes from this genome. You cannot detect mutations or so, right? This is the wrong method. But this is a great method to sequence individual RNA molecules. And actually, another advantage is that you can get very, very long reads. So with Illumina, you get short reads, let's say 100 or so nucleotides. And here you can get very long reads, sometimes 20,000, sometimes 50,000 nucleotides. So you can actually see different RNA isoforms, right, that still carry introns or have lost an intron or are alternatively spliced and so forth. Okay, so far so good. Um, there's of course hundreds of different methods now in functional genomics. Uh, you can read long, long reviews. Uh, so basically people have derived a lot of protocols for their purposes, whatever they want to see. I just introduced a few methods which are really standard methods that everybody uh, uses or, or, or has used in the past. Um, and one of them is, of course, ChIP-seq, chromatin immunoprecipitation coupled to sequencing, right? This is an occupancy profiling method. So you can find all your uh, uh, factors of interest over the entire genome because you can look at the occupancy of factors over the genome. Another method is CLIP, uh, which is doing the same on the RNA level. So now you can ask, where are certain proteins binding to the transcriptome rather than the genome? And actually, by the way, we think there's 600 or 800 RNA binding factors. Yesterday, I told you there's maybe 1,800 or so DNA binding factors, transcription factors in the human genome. But there's also 600 or 800 approximately RNA binding factors. So a lot of regulation also on the RNA level. And then, you know, methods like ATAC-seq uh, help you to define the regions on the genome that are nucleosome depleted, right, that are accessible. Uh, so you can find, for example, enhancers this way or putative enhancers because you can detect regions in the genome that are not promoters but are still nucleosome depleted. So these are then candidate regions. They could be enhancers, right, because proteins can bind there when the Nucleosomes are gone. And then, of course, all the transcriptomic techniques that we just discussed, RNA-seq, PortU-seq, TT-seq, and actually other technologies also. Um, I will go through that very quickly because we have so many things to do, but that's something you can probably discuss also on Thursday if you have questions. But these protocols you find in all the textbooks and online, of course. So ChIP-seq, I think uh, most of you will anyway know for occupancy profiling of the genome. And uh, CLIP, actually, there's, it's still being optimized. These are very difficult techniques. The CHIP methods are standardized, but the CLIP techniques are very difficult to trap proteins on RNA. One of them is PAR-CLIP uh, that we have used in the past. It works very well in some cells and not very well in others. Um, but basically here, uh, you also use the labeling uh, of RNA with 4-thiouracil or 4-thiouridine, and that uh, uh, enhances the cross-linking efficiency, which is required to you know, pull down then the RNA fragments that are associated with your protein of interest. Okay, before I move to the next part, as always, uh, some time for questions questions. So the, you know, we have a lot of 
things to discuss for transcription elongation, but we should take the time. If you have general questions about this RNA labeling or how to do transcriptomics, multiomics actually becomes important. Yeah. Like, I mean, does it affect the compressibility of the enzyme somehow? Or? That's a great question, actually. And, you know, in the first years when we established that method, uh, actually still in Munich together with um, somebody called Lars Dölken, who has done that very early on viruses and uh, helped us in the beginning, uh, we tried to optimize that. And so the best we got is that um, about one in 100 U residues in the RNA is exchanged by 4 psi or U. So you may say, oh, that's terrible, <laughs> really bad. But you know, there's a lot of limitations. Um, you cannot put a ton of the material on cells. At some stage, it will be, you know, cells won't grow properly anymore. And also, there's a limitation to actually bring these compounds into cells. In yeast, for example, you have to express this transporter to actually get the nucleoside in. Um, later, we learned, you know, after we've done all the effort, <laughs> that when you use the uracil, it is about fivefold easier to get it into cells. So it was a lot of trial and error, but the best we could get is about 1 in 100. But actually, what is interesting is that it doesn't hurt you. So basically, it only uh, causes some problems for very short RNAs because there the likelihood that you label them becomes very low. And this is what is called the labeling bias. So actually, if you plot your RNAs according to lengths, how, you know, over the entire genome, and then you, you, you ask, um, you know, how, which RNAs did I trap in my experiment, then it looks very good for the long RNAs. And then when they get shorter and shorter, the efficiency of trapping them gets lower. And we've called that the labeling bias. And then what we do is simply that we, you know, use a mathematical uh, model to enhance that a little bit, to remove that bias so that you get a better, like a more equal, you know, distribution of the RNAs over the genome. This is, of course, a mathematical trick, but it helps you to get a better estimate um, of transcription activity. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing I wanted to still say is um, that nowadays what we do is multi-omics, and many groups are doing this. And why is that important? As always, you know, when you look at things from different angles, you understand better the process. So, for example, uh, you can use occupancy profiling to find out where RNA polymerase 2 is bound to the genome. Where do you find it over the genome, right? And then you can use the TTSeq to find out where are uh, RNAs produced over the genome. And when you have both information, uh, both types of information, you get a better feeling for what's actually happening at those genes. Now I will give you um, uh, examples later on what you can actually do then, because you can then input multiple data sets into your mathematical modeling, and you can actually do kinetics in cells. You know, rather than just saying, oh, I observe the polymerase here, or I detect an RNA here, you can actually say something about the kinetics. Like, you know, what is the rate of RNA synthesis, of course, but also what is the uh, duration of polymerase pausing at a certain gene. You can extract that also. So I will give you examples later on. Other questions? Yes. Um, there's, you know, almost every day there's something coming out. There was recently something called STL-seq, which um, is interesting for us because you can actually draw some conclusions on the initiation rates of transcription, which is very interesting because, uh, you know, how often you actually start transcription will determine about how many mRNAs you make per time, right? And that initial or this initiation frequency is actually very hard to measure because some polymerases are dropping off from genes. So it's called STL-seq. 
uh, was done by a group in Yale. Actually, I recently visited and gave a talk there and, and met. It's a young professor who, with his group, uh, invented that. So basically, the, the field is moving all the time. And basically, what we do now is if we have a certain question, we you know, modify a method or we invent a method to address that question. But with these protocols, you can already do a lot of things. Yeah. Also, what is currently still being developed is, you know, to better define splicing kinetics. Uh, it's not easy because it happens fast and, um, you know, there's alternative splicing and so forth. But uh, we have taken some first steps and other groups are also working on this. Okay. Good, so let's move on to our second part, which will be a longer part on transcription elongation and a little bit about regulation. And hopefully at the end, uh, you will understand how you can regulate transcription on the elongation level. It's not easy to understand because you should say, you know, if I look after 10 hours, how many mRNA molecules were produced from my gene, I don't care whether the polymerase was a little bit slower or a little bit faster, right? This will not change things if it takes 50, 40 minutes to transcribe. Um, but actually, there's still a huge regulatory potential on the elongation level. And this is because elongation, and that's the take-home message, elongation can also control initiation, as we will see today. And when you control initiation, you control the number of events, you know, how often a polymerase actually starts to transcribe in a certain time window. And that, of course, determines the output, how many mRNA molecules you make per time. It's a big misconception by many people in the field that, you know, the speed of polymerase can change anything. It, it doesn't change things. Because then, you know, instead of 40 minutes, you take 45 minutes to transcribe. But if you look after half a day, this doesn't change the number of RNA molecules. What is changing the number of RNA molecules is how often you transcribe. Very important to remember, very simple, but you know, when you read the literature, this kind of thought got lost over the years. Okay, I think yesterday I stopped by showing you the RNA polymerase II elongation complex. And this is just to define the important parts of the complex you have here the downstream DNA, remember, we defined it as the DNA uh, where the polymerase is moving towards. So this downstream DNA, you could also say, is entering the polymerase active center cleft. Then the two strands are unwound just before the active center. And the template strand in blue is then running over the so-called bridge helix. And here's the template base that is directing which nucleoside triphosphate is bound uh, stably to the active side of the polymerase, and then uh, which nucleotide is actually incorporated into the growing RNA chain that you see in red. So here would be the three prime end of the RNA attached to the catalytic metal RNA. And then you see the DNA-RNA hybrid. Remember I talked about the eight to nine base pairs yesterday? So the RNA transcript stays attached to the DNA template for about nine base pairs. And then there's elements in the polymerase, uh, in particular also this so-called lit element, that separate the RNA strand from the DNA. And then basically the RNA can exit through a tunnel from the polymerase and it will reach the surface. Whereas the DNA template strand will, you know, extend upwards and then recombine with the non-template strand. So the reason why you maintain a transcription bubble is because the polymerase binds very tightly to the DNA-RNA hybrid, right? And this way it keeps the single strand of the template trapped in the active site, whereas the non-template is running outside of the polymerase. I will show you a movie, and that movie we actually uh, made exactly 10 years ago. It was the first movie of transcription based on different structures. And then I show it to you later briefly again, if we have time, uh, after I explained everything more precisely. So here's the nucleoside triphosphate binding site. Um, you will see now in orange, the nucleoside triphosphate substrate entering with the metal ion B here. 
And then the active site is closing. There's two elements, the bridge helix and the trigger loop. They are folded and then you get a phosphodiester bond and the pyrophosphate is released. And now you have translocation of the next DNA base into the active site of the polymerase. So this happens in two steps. There's a twisting motion and now the nucleotide addition cycle can start all over. So the next nucleoside triphosphate is entering, active site is closing, phosphodiester bond is formed, pyrophosphate is released, and then again translocation of the next DNA base into the active site. And what can happen is that this process is blocked by a toxin called alpha amenitine. This is a mushroom toxin, so don't eat these mushrooms. Um, still, there are several people killed every year in Germany because they con get confused with the mushrooms. And um, another mechanism is proofreading. So here, you know, this nucleotide has been misincorporated and the polymerase can actually remove a dinucleotide uh, that contains the misincorporated nucleotide. It has an intrinsic proofreading activity. And yet another interesting mechanism is backtracking. So the polymerase runs backwards, now the downstream DNA is going out, and that means that the RNA has to run through a pore. It exits through a pore underneath the active site. Now the three prime end is down here, polymerase is arrested, and there's this rescue factor called TF2S, which can actually enter the pore of the polymerase and it can stimulate the endonucleolytic RNA cleavage activity of the polymerase, it can then remove this backtracked uh, RNA and then basically uh, reactivate the polymerase. So the arrested polymerase is reactivated. There's a new 3' end at the active site from which transcription can resume. Now you may say, oh, this was all fast. <laughs> I didn't get it. We will go now through the steps and then we look at the movie again, right? So the nucleotide addition cycle that we saw starts with binding of the correct nucleoside triphosphate. It brings in the second metal and then the phosphodiester bond is formed. Remember I told you about the SN2 type of reaction. Pyrophosphate is released and now the RNA has been extended by one nucleotide. But of course now the end of the RNA is occupying the substrate binding site, right? So it has to be translocated forward in order to free the substrate binding site. And this is accompanied by a shift of the bridge helix. So the bridge helix is moving to the left. It's basically by this fluctuation, it's pushing the DNA-RNA hybrid forward. Uh, it's a, what we call a Brownian redshirt. So the bridge helix is moving like that and it's pushing on the DNA-RNA hybrid. But then when the bridge helix you know, swings back into that position, you have again a free nucleoside triphosphate substrate binding site. So you can repeat that cycle. Now many people ask, well, how does the polymerase know which nucleotide to take? Well, in reality, there's a sampling, right? You have all the four types of nucleoside triphosphates, but only those that can form here Watson Crick base pairs with the coding template base, only those will have a certain residency time in the active site. So only those will then allow for the chemistry, for catalysis and, and bond formation. Sometimes an error occurs and then you have to proofread the transcript. Um, but before I show you this, just briefly again, the alpha amanitine. So these are the kind of mushrooms you shouldn't eat. Um, I have to tell you a little story from my postdoc when I was at Stanford. I was interested, of course, to analyze this mechanism, once we had solved the polymerase structure, we wanted to know where does the alpha manitin go? And there was another postdoc, Dave Bushnell, who worked with me and who worked on, on the manitin problem. And then, you know, we asked somebody in botany, uh, can we get a little bit of this uh, mushroom because we're interested in various issues, for example, why is the mushroom not killed by its own toxin, right? So we wanted to investigate this. And then one day I saw this man coming into the lab with a huge bag and putting these mushrooms on the table. Huge bag of these um, very toxic mushrooms which we then locked somewhere because we were afraid somebody would take them or so. And so I learned that actually, you know, eating only half of a cap uh, is enough to be, that's a lethal dose for, for an adult. Uh, 
So these are really toxic mushrooms. And uh, it's um, apparently that the, the, what is terrible is that those people who eat them uh, report that they're quite tasty. But then, you know, it, it gives you enormous pain within half a day, one day. And basically, unless you have a liver transplant, you cannot be rescued because the polymerase in your liver is blocked and if there's no transcription in your liver there's no metabolism and basically you're killed um, by having dysfunctional organs. It's really terrible. And this is a cyclic peptide that binds here underneath the bridge helix and the trigger loop. And so basically the way the toxin works is that you know there's this motion of the bridge helix and the trigger loop that are important to translocate the nucleic acids. And so if you block that motion then you can still incorporate one nucleotide, but then the polymerase doesn't move forward, so it stops. And this is the mechanism that we defined at that time. Now, what happens when you misincorporate a the nucleotide? Uh, then proofreading occurs, and this is the proofreading cycle. So what happens is that you know, the misincorporated uh, base uh, will not base pair properly with the template base, so there's a mismatch, right? There's no Watson Crick pairing, there's a mismatch. And this destabilizes the situation at the active site, and the polymerase then actually slides backwards. We call that backstepping, because it's just one step that is sliding backwards. And then this misincorporated base is uh, frayed off, so basically, since there's no good pairing, when you slide back, then the base is paired off like this. So we call that fraying of the misincorporated base. And then what is interesting, actually um, a Russian uh, uh, researcher found that, uh, that this base can, almost like a ribozyme, you know, this RNA base can help in its own removal by recruiting a nucleophilic water molecule, which then attacks the phosphodiester bond here and this is how you release a dinucleotide, a dinucleotide which then incorporates the mis, in, uh, or which contains the misincorporated nucleotide. And when you do that, you generate a new three prime end. So here's now a new three prime end at the active site, and you can resume transcription. Try again to incorporate the correct nucleotide. Now, in, you know, in addition to this backstepping, the polymerase can also do multiple steps backwards, and then we call that backtracking. And when the backtracking occurs, then RNA has to be inserted into this pore underneath uh, the active site. So normally, you know, the exiting RNA, the, the five prime end here, exits from the RNA exit tunnel on the surface, right? But when you now reverse the direction, everything runs backwards. So the polymerase, instead of running forward, it's now running backwards, right? It's running to the left. Uh, this is backtracking. Then the RNA has to also move backwards because the three prime end is extruded into the pore. And why is this so? It's because the DNA-RNA hybrid is um, retained, right? So the base pairing between DNA and RNA is maintained. It's like a zipper motion. So if you, if you maintain the base pairs, there's no slipping like this. This doesn't happen, right? There's the DNA-RNA hybrid. So basically, it's, it's such a motion, right? And when you do that, then the RNA has to, when you backtrack the polymerase, the RNA has to enter this pore here. And then the three prime end is totally misaligned with the active site. So polymerase stops and it arrests because there's no three prime end in the active site. And then to rescue these arrested polymerases, this factor TF2S has to enter and has to stimulate the endonucleolytic activity of the polymerase. So, you know, in terms of evolution, this is super exciting because you have an active site that has two different activities. It can do the polymerization, but it also can do the RNA cleavage. Right? Where do we have that? Most enzymes are optimized to carry out one reaction. But here, this active site can do both. And it's not the reversal of synthesis, right? The nucleolytic cleavage is hydrolysis because water molecule is attacking. The reversal of synthesis would be pyrophosphorolysis because the pyrophosphate would have to attack, right? This also occurs, by the way. 
But um, what we have here is uh, uh, nuclease activity, it's hydrolysis. It's not the reversal of synthesis, it's a second activity of the active cell. But it's actually, you know, quite um, weak. It's a weak endonucleolytic activity. So what you need is this factor TF2S, which stimulates. It has an acidic finger that it points into the active site and it stimulates this nucleus activity. So that's the cycle of backtracking, arrest, and reactivation of polymerase. Yes, please. Is there any special trigger for backtracking? Very good point. Yeah, you know when it happens, it happens all the time when the polymerase tries to go through nucleosomes. Because it's a competition, I will show you that Moritz made a nice movie. Um, a competition between the nucleosome and the polymerase. Polymerase tries to go forward. Nucleosome tries to stay in place, right? Because it uses binding energy to capture the DNA. And the polymerase tries to peel off the DNA. So it's a competition. And sometimes the nucleosome wins. And then the polymerase is pushed backwards. And it ends up in an arrested state. And this is why this factor TF2S, which used to be like a boring old transcription factor already described in 1976 or something, it suddenly became very interesting again because it was found that it's really important over the last 10 years, you know, to go through chromatin. Let's look at the movie again and then uh, I can ask, uh, answer more questions. But just um, maybe, I think you will now look at it differently because we've discussed the individual steps. So here's the bridge helix, template strand running over the bridge helix, trigger loop in red, bridge helix in green. Here's the substrate binding site, metal ion A at the three prime end of the growing RNA chain. Now the nucleoside triphosphate comes in in orange with metal B. Active site is closing. Now you have a catalytically competent conformation, you form a phosphodiester bond and the pyrophosphate is released. Right? And now the next template base, shown here in pink, is entering the active site in two steps. There's forward translocation and then there's this twisting motion, a 90 degree twist. And then the nucleotide addition cycle can uh, uh, start all over. Now you have the nuclear nucleoside bound, again, phosphodiester bond formation. Active site uh, is moving into this conformation that's important for translocation. And now you see again alpha manitine, it blocks translocation because it freezes this Brownian redshirt in a certain state. Now we look at proofreading. This is a misincorporated base, right? So this, there's no Watson-Crick base pairing. So you see this fraying and you see the backstepping, so the dinucleotide can then be removed by this intrinsic endonucleolytic activity. And that corrects the error, the misincorporation error. And now we see the backtracking, right? So everything runs backwards. Instead of DNA entering, it's now exiting downstream, and RNA is exiting into this pore underneath the active site. And it's actually stably bound here. There's a binding site for RNA. So it's an arrested state. Now TF2S has to come, it displaces the RNA. You see the displacement. And then this domain three of TF2S enters and it has this acidic loop. It can then trigger or stimulate the endonucleolytic activity. And it generates a new three prime end uh, in the active site from which transcription can resume. Now you had a question. <laughs> So yeah, with the mask, I had problems to understand. Say it again. Sorry, um, I was wondering how how the amount of uh, backtracking, uh, how much backtracking is done. Uh, is how does that compare to uh, the diff different or distance of the different RNA polymerase following each other? So is ah, th this is a very good question, but it's unknown. Right. It's a very good question, but it's unknown. And so we know, you know, from uh, some studies in bacteria that uh, uh, a trailing polymerase that is behind a pioneering front polymerase uh, can maybe help the first one if it gets stuck. So it could be that these convoys of polymerases uh, 
that we discussed briefly yesterday, that one purpose is that they help each other. So if one gets stuck, then the ones that are behind can push the first one. So it also in translation, there have been such studies that a second ribosome can help, you know, to rescue a first ribosome that somehow got paused or arrested. So this is well possible that they actually cooperate. But there's very little evidence, very few papers. Yes, please. Ah, that's a very good point. Yeah, so um, it's difficult to detect. Um, people have done that, uh, especially I think the lab of Karen Edelman in the US, by comparing two data sets um, with active TF2S and inactive TF2S. And then you can see these differences of about 10 bases or so. Because there's methods where people actually this is called the NetSeq technology. I didn't mention it, but it's a very important one, where you sequence the three prime end of the RNA. Uh, and when you now you know, sequence only those RNAs that are attached to polymerase, you can actually find the three prime end of all the new transcripts on the genome. This is called nascent elongating transcript sequencing or NetSeq. Yeah, it was first invented by uh, Weissman and um, uh, Churchman, Sterling Churchman and, and Weissman have invented that. And so basically if you would use that protocol, you get the three prime ends and then you do it without TF2S, it may shift by 10 because the cleavage doesn't occur. And there's some papers that, that have done that. It's very difficult <coughs> technically, but it's in principle possible. Yes. The proofreading? No, the um, bridges. Oh, the bridge helix. Yeah, that's also a very good point. Um, you know, when I first got the structure, I compared it uh, to uh, like Cleno DNA polymerase or uh, the T7 phage polymerase. And they all have a helix at that position. And that helix often is also seen to be moving. And in, in the T7 polymers, it's actually called the O helix, you know, the letter O. And uh, you can, comp you know, if you align the nucleic acids, you can see that that helix is in the same place. But actually the topology around it is different. But I think the principle is the same, that, you know, you have a, a DNA-RNA hybrid and it ends, this hybrid ends with the last base pair, the newly synthesized base pair. And now there's a helix basically that is fluctuating and pushing it forward. Um, so that is, seems to be the same. Yeah. And you also find that they vary in um, coloring um, in the bridge helix. It's, so sorry? I think in the old helix there's this um, coloring red. Yes. So it's like this red. And you also find that in the bridge helix. Wow, you really go into the details. So there's a tyrosine residue exactly at the point where the DNA template strand is traversing the bridge helix. And this tyrosine actually can even swing and we don't know for sure, but it, it may be that it's like, you know, lubricant, that that's more, it's easier for the template strand to go over. And there's a tyrosine in a similar position in other polymerases. But I don't think that this is universal. I'm, I'm not sure, but you can find it in other polymerases. Other questions? Some of you have already thought about things very carefully. Okay, let's move on. Let's see in terms of how we are we doing with time. Yeah, I think we're okay. Oh, should we do, actually we should do a, a quick break, right? You want to have a five minute break? Yeah, okay. Let's meet in five minutes. Thank you. <laughs>